everyone. So uh, I hope you've been enjoying the presentations as much as I have so far. A bit of a change tack into bees here, um, which I'm a bit worried about. We have all these people who run cropping, livestock, dairies, lots of presentations from people who run cropping, livestock, dairies. Um, so my livestock do look a little bit different. Uh, lucky for me, Stefan and, and Mary did sort of introduce the fact that they're still big players. Uh, do we have any other commercial beekeepers here? No, only my husband. This could be a bit, uh, <laughs> a bit rough. Uh, do we have any backyard beekeepers here? Anyone with a hive or two? Cool, yep. So you guys, make sure you read my report when it comes out. You are going to need it. Uh, what about anyone who eats food that's pollinated by bees or grows crops that need it? Cool, right. So uh, this could be a problem for all of us then. So I applied for this scholarship to study integrated pest management for a little-known pest on bees in Southeast Asia. But just before the round two interviews, a mite was discovered on bees near Newcastle in New South Wales. So I changed tack. I uh, packed my bags to go and meet beekeepers from around Australia on the eradication effort. So for decades, Australia was privileged to be the only beekeeping um, continent free of varroa mite. This little guy up here. Australia has spent tens of millions of dollars keeping this mite out in the full knowledge that one day we would be stuck with it. June 22nd, 2022 is the day that will be remembered by beekeepers throughout Australia. Varroa destructor is the world's worst uh, pest to European honeybees worldwide. So you know we all have viruses that we don't even know about. Well, so do bees, except that when something starts sucking on the fat body that you use as your immune system, you will start knowing about those viruses. It's also one of the largest parasitic mites in the world in relation to its host. So this one isn't big enough to be a proper human equivalent, but you can imagine what that feels like, stuck half under your skin, sucking on your liver, and then it chews on your children and reproduces in their bedroom. <laughs> Not fun. <laughs> so this mite only appeared in the 1950s, when its ancestors jumped from their old friend, the Asian honeybee, to a European honeybee that just had zero defences against it. And it was only declared a new species, Varroa destructor, in 2000. So in only 70 years, it spread around the world, leaving a wake of devastation. 30 to 60% of beekeepers do not survive in the industry once Varroa shows up. And Stefan already brought up earlier how much this could affect our pollination. So up until this point, I just assumed that for such a common pest, there would be a wealth of research and integrated pest management methods. Nothing I could add there. But anyone who looks at research will realise that the majority of it goes on in some very temperate parts of the map there. And very little of it gets done across the middle here, where I happen to run my beekeeping operation. So in the warmth and lush greenery of the subtropics, where I run Honeyvale Farm and Ballina Honey, we keep bees very differently to down here in Tasmania. That queen lays eggs all year round, Honey harvests and swarms happen all year. We have pests like this little guy, small hive beetle, who will strike fear into the hearts of Tasmanian beekeepers since it made a brief uh, biosecurity breach into Fortress Tasmania near here for the first time last year. It's OK, it's currently considered eradicated. What we do share with Tasmanian beekeepers, though, is customer expectations. People buy Australian beeswax knowing that they can use it on their fruit or in their face creams, or in there uh, for uh, any food, food grade process, and it will not have chemical residues in it. It's going to become a real problem, though, because the majority of the world manages varroa mite with some pretty heavy duty chemicals, none of which work well with tropical beekeeping. So I scoured the USA for management methods which would keep us in business, and what I found was pretty grim. Beekeepers with 50% or more of their hives dying in some years. Every piece of beeswax you can find has chemical contamination in it. In New Zealand, they're starting to see contamination of their honey. Around the world, mites have developed resistance to a lot of the chemical controls. There's some organic acids that can work without these issues, but they're not as effective, or they're very hard on bees, or they're very hard on beekeepers. There's some good hive design and husbandry ideas, but they're not enough. And here I am, looking grim in Hawaii. We're actually looking excited because I found a feral hive which is surprisingly uncommon overseas. 
Um, there were some other scholars at a B sale, at a, sorry, at a bull sale in uh, Calgary. It was like minus 10 degrees or something horrible like that. So, um, yeah, my best advice to you scholars, study something tropical. <laughs> um, so after that, I went to Europe. I did go there in the middle of summer. It was just slightly colder than in the northern rivers in, in uh, the middle of winter. And this is Thomas Van Pelt. He runs Bergbien, which is mountain bees, with about 100 hives. And he does this with no chemical mite management at all, not even organic acids. So Thomas is at one of his local bee clubs in Wangen, in southern Germany, in June, demonstrating some of his mite management methods that he develops and researches with the Under Arrest program. Perfect name for capturing mites. So you'll note that Australians have a lot to learn from Germans about breeding gentle bees too. Um, do not ever try standing around hives like this at 7pm in the evening pulling things apart with no bee suit on in Australia. Yeah, most of our bees are not that gentle. So there's quite a range of these uh, chemical control methods starting to be used across Europe. Um, people, people with different shaped hives, up to 15,000 hives. The basic premises are always the same. Number one. If you stop the queen from laying eggs, you stop the mite from laying eggs, because the mite has to reproduce in the cell with the baby bees. So you can put her in a little cage, like this one here, where the other bees can still care for her, and when she comes out, she starts laying eggs a lot quicker than the, than the mite does, giving the bees an edge. And then you've got premise number two. The mite is always looking for those cells with baby bees so it can reproduce. So you can put her in a queen, you can put your queen, in a queen isolation cage, also known as her summer holiday home. <laughs> it's literally what they call it in Germany. So you put your queen in, you swap your frames out in the right sequence, and you can catch up to 95% of your mites because there's nowhere else in the box for them to lay, and they all jump in there. So uh, obviously you do set your bees back a little bit by doing that, but they do recover quickly. And you can actually increase your honey harvest by 20% if you time it right, because all of your bees will be out foraging instead of running daycare for baby bees. And it's not an entirely new concept around the world. Uh, people do use, they do uh, get the, get the uh, queen to lay out a frame of male bees, male bee eggs, because the queen can pick, and then lays the eggs, mites jump in, once they're all capped off, pull it out, you can feed it to your chickens. Not a uh, complete treatment, but you do remove an awful lot of mites, and the male bees weren't pulling their weight collecting nectar anyway. <laughs> so, on September 19th, 2023, the National Management Group in Australia realised that eradication was futile and announced the move to management of varroa mite in Australia. No turning back. So the landscape totally changed between when I applied for my scholarship and now when uh, we're sort of, there's no, there's no going back and Australians will be managing varroa mite. So when varroa mite reaches Tasmania, the beekeeper who uh, posts her lip balms and shampoo bars and whatnot around Australia-wide, there's a few Tasmanian companies that do that, may be able to guarantee their customers that there's zero risk of chemical residues in their beeswax with these methods. It's a lot harder when you're helping pollinators who run thousands of hives but uh, hopefully Australians can uh, come up with some good methods. But is that the end of the story? We have some very experienced farmers in this room with best practice integrated pest management in action on their farms. If that's you, you might be thinking, number one is to use stock resistant to the pest. Why don't we find bees that are resistant to mites? Well, back on this map here, you may have seen a smattering of red spots, a very light smattering. Those spots have populations of bees that do manage varroa mite on their own. They are not large areas. Some populations are doing well, others not so well and dying off. It's not easy when you're dealing with a totally new pest you have no defences against, and all of our usual beekeeping practices help mites more than they help bees. European honeybees are the most moved livestock in Australia, and they totally ignore any separating fences. If they can't find their own home, they just land at somebody else's place for a bit. Really good way to spread pests. We can't import bloodlines from any of these red spots because Australia got lucky and so far has avoided the worst bee virus that is found almost everywhere else in the world. In fact, the spots where it's not found are so small, there's no, no point even putting them on, on the map there. That's deformed wing virus. 
We need to keep it out. So we need to find out what our bees can do. It's cutting edge research. No one knows what genes are responsible for varroa resistance yet. Genetics is complicated when you've got a queen who flies over fences and mates with 12 different male bees. So the mission of discovery for how these bees are even managing it is still being untangled. We do know that bees who are good at it are adept at sniffing out which cells have mites reproducing in them, and then they uncap the cell, they pull the baby bee out, and they interrupt the mite breeding. And that's what uh, these bees are doing here. That's a little bit hard to tell on there. You kind of had to be there. Um, it could be something the adult bees are doing or something the baby bees are doing that's actually causing the behaviour. We don't even know yet. So these bees belong to Steve Riley in the UK, where he's part of the uh, Varroa Resistance Breeding Program run by Westerham Beekeeping Club. And these bees might have to uncap and recap a lot of cells to find the right one with the mite in it. But a good queen breeder... Um, by the way, if you're feeling bored, you can do a bit of queen spotting on that, on that slide there. I've made it a nice hard one for people. Um, but a good queen breeder has a range of ways of figuring out which queens are good at doing this. And unfortunately, one of the ways this research was confirmed was that Australian bees do this at really low rates. But some will be better than others, and it's a starting point. Beekeepers right now around Newcastle are seeing wild hives and hives from beekeepers who, who uh, fail to keep mite numbers down die off and leave. So a mite's the size of a sesame seed on the underside of the bee. You will not know it's there unless you look in the right way and with the right equipment. Dying hives are being robbed out by healthy hives and they just see free food. They're taking all those mites back home. Rural resistant genetics that we do have in some of these areas will be overwhelmed and die off. So Australia has over 75 square, um, feral hives in every square kilometre on average. So this cycle might go on for five to ten years before we see steady, stable numbers of mites that Australian bees and beekeepers can learn to manage. And the genetic range of bees in Australia will actually need to shift, just like the genetic range of humans in Europe shifted when the plague hit. The better we can do this process, the better off the Australian beekeeping industry will be. But my favourite photo is actually this one. After the demonstration in Wangen in Germany, I popped open the back of the hive to check out Rudy's neat hive record keeping system. And there was this little guy. Rudy runs about 250 hives and he owns the hives that Thomas demonstrated with. And he's been managing Varroa mite chemical free for about a year now. And this little guy is a pseudoscorpion. He eats mites for breakfast, very tasty. So, of course, if you're using chemical mite management, this guy and his family are some of the first to die. You kill off your hive ecology, it's collateral damage. He was never going to eat enough mites to save your bees, but he was doing no harm, and he was happy to help out. And that's what integrated pest management does. It's management which doesn't damage your environment. We've had a lot of talks so far about biodiversity and preserving your natural capital, and that's what these methods are all, biotechnical methods are all about management which you are happy to hand on to your kids and to the next generation of beekeepers with confidence. So even if you don't have bees yourself, you probably know someone who does. Now that you have a solid appreciation of what they're going to be up against, make sure you give them a big hug, tell them you are so sorry their bees are going to have to deal with varroa mite now or in the future as it spreads, and make sure you send them in the direction of my Nuffield report. Not out yet, but it will be out shortly so that Australia's beekeepers can lead the way with world's best practice solutions. And this is the only, only the start of our journey with Varroa mite, but I would like to give a massive thank you to all the parties who set this journey off in the right direction. In particular, Nuffield Australia, my amazing sponsor, AgriFutures, who helps a lot of beekeepers, and my wonderful husband, Luke Edwards, who did lots of driving on the wrong or right, depending on where you live, side of the road for me. Thank you very much. Thank you.